on behalf of the Indian Academy of Neurology. I am Dr. Guhan Ramamurthy, your host for today for the IAN talk show with the Legends of Neurology. It is a great pleasure and honor to introduce the legend, Professor Zahir Ahmad Sayed, who is currently Senior Consultant Neurologist in Apollo Hospitals, Chennai. A legend whose knowledge in neurology commands respect from neurological societies across the globe. He is clinical neurology personified and has mastered the art of neuroelectrophysiology. In fact, when I was doing my uh, post-graduation in DM Neurology in MMC, uh, we hear stories that his, his post-admission day rounds makes everyone high on neurology and his questioning ses sessions send a shudder down the spine. And I am happy that I am on the questioning side today and not on the receiving side. And to start with Professor Zahir sir did his graduation and post-graduation in medicine at Madras Medical College, University of Madras and the Montreal Neurological Institute, McGill University, Montreal, Canada. He was awarded the Hobnath Prize in medicine in his undergraduate course and the Nageshwara Rao Kuntulu gold medal during his MD degree. He was mentored by eminent neuroscientists, Professor G. Arjundas, Professor B. Ramamurthy, Professor Francis McNaughton, Professor Herbert Jasper, Professor Pierre Glue, Professor Wilder Penfield. And sir, we have always seen you as a fatherly figure in neurology. And now we would like to begin to hear from you about your childhood, the other end of the spectrum, where it all began, how you grew up and your favorite moments in childhood. Well, whatever the, my date of birth, which is 1939, sorry, 38 December, I was born to, my parents were, uh, let's say, my father was a Yunani doctor working with the Corporation of uh, Madras. My uh, mother was a school teacher. My main support was my mother. And uh, from there on, since we are short of time, I didn't want to do I didn't want to do medicine. I'm sorry, I didn't want to do any uh, MD. You know, I didn't want to do that. I was more intent in joining the army because for four years I had done senior uh, senior NCC. I had passed the C certificate in artillery, so I wanted to become uh, 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 officer in the army. And uh, I was hoping that if I did that, I will retire. The, I was there as a, this was what the chief of army staff. Well, that didn't happen because you know why? Very simple. My glasses at that time were six minus six on both sides, so they said we won't take you. So I had no options at that time to get into medicine. But I think I did well. Okay, now I'm going to take you there from there. Uh, from school, I was never a good student in school. All or, or, or yucky, you know, no, uh, didn't do well in school. That uh, didn't do well in school lasted only until I got into MEBS. I don't know what happened in MEBS. The whole, whole thing changed, absolutely. From MBBS to MD, I, you know, I graduated MD with a, a Nageshwara Pantul gold medal, and I graduated from MBBS with the Hobart Prize. In the in the middle, before I started the first year of uh, medicine, uh, I must tell you, I was in NCC, so I was I took the in Madras contingent of NCC to the Republic Day Parade, but still I couldn't get into the army. Well, that's one side of this thing. After I finished MD, I'm going to go rapidly because I don't have that much time. My, I, trans, I was transported to MNI even before I passed my uh, MD. But MD was 1965, uh, first shot. And at MNI, I was resident and chief resident in neurology. I was chief resident in EEG. Uh, we saw synoidal electrodes and IV pentothal being done. Learned to put in synoidal electrodes. And uh, First time at the in the at Montreal with Dr. McNaughton, I saw my first patient with uh, myasthenia gravis. I didn't know how to recognize. I'm talking about 1967. That's the first time 
I was taught that this is how you will do your look at myasthenia gravis. And after that, it was a routine, uh, uh, routine residency in uh, neurology and routine residency in uh, uh, EEG. Uh, I finished my fellowship in Canada. Uh, it is a first time exam and I got my fellowship. And then after that, we shifted to US, Cook County Hospital, three universities, Northwestern, University of Illinois, and Chicago Medical School. Now, I must say that was an interesting thing because we, uh, I worked there for three years uh, as a faculty member in these uh, three uh, universities. And um, my first paper came out from there. First paper, gonococcal meningitis. I have a copy. If you can find the copy there, get me a copy. If you find a copy there, I have a copy of it. Can you imagine 1969 or 1971? I still keep the paper, gonococcal meningitis, and that was my first first paper. After that, there was not. There was. I'm showing you the paper. Can you see it? Yes, sir. That's excellent, sir. And it's a really, really uh, old, even the paper wise, sir. Yeah. Old paper, gonococcal meningitis, and our, our, and the. Uh, I don't think I did any, many, many publications after that. The only important incident which happened during that time was Dr. B.R. came to Chicago. And he said, in uh, classical Tamil, you come back to Madras. Yes. Sir. And that took me to Madras, Chennai in 1972. I joined the Institute of Neurology. 19, were you born in 72? Hello, Guhan, were you born in 72? Yes, I was not even born at that time, yes, sir. I joined the Institute of Neurology in Madras in 1972. Shall I proceed? Uh, yes, sir. Just at this time, also, we would like to hear what, your, what were your favorite moments during your college days, sir? And any other moments, I was not, uh, no, my favorite, you, it is very, it is very uh, pathetic to say that. I was not a sportsman. I was not, uh, no, there was not much money around. So the one couldn't have any favorite moments. So the only other money that I could spend was on the, on uh, starching my NCC uniform for going for the first class battery parades. So that was my thing. But that was good enough. No problems about it. And that uh, gave me one gave me an option that I should be in the army. Uh, that's an enormous uh, intellectual stimulus. You understand what I mean? Yes, but sir. since then, that worked out. Anyway, I joined uh, medicine. And I don't think I've done that bad at all, basically. Yeah, I'm all right, basically. Now, I, since the time is short, I could talk, could go on talking, but let me be crisp and uh, finish up. In yes. uh, MIM, I will introduce about your uh, further, uh, before we proceed further, sir. I have the next part of introduction, sir. Uh, so, Professor Zahir Ahmad, sir, who is an excellent teacher, has had held various teaching positions in national and international institutions, notable of which are the Northwestern University, University of Illinois, Chicago, USA, Institute of Neurology, Government General Hospital, Madras Medical College, Chennai, and Government Roy Peta Hospital, Chennai. In fact, he had initiated the neuro neurology department in the Government Roy Peta Hospital, Chennai. And he was the founder professor of Department of Neurology and Neurophysiology at Apollo Hospitals, Chennai, and the Department of Neurophysiology, Southern Railway Hospital, Chennai. Professor Zahir, sir, who is an academician par excellence, has been president of Indian Academy of Neurology and treasurer of Indian Epilepsy Association. He continues as the fellow of Royal College of Physicians, Canada. He has delivered the Glaxo oration of the Indian Academy of Medical Sciences and was awarded the Lifetime Achievement Award of the Chennai Neuro Trust. His contribution to the field of epilepsy has been significant and noteworthy. He has authored several publications in EEG, clinical studies in epilepsy, and most importantly, subacute sclerosing, panencephalitis, and myasthenia gravis. And in fact, we had the privilege of listening, listening to this lecture from the master himself during the EEG uh, seminar, which was organized. His passion for clinical neurophysiology is well known and he has conducted various workshops on neurophysiology na nationally and internationally. Professor Zahir sir has made his pioneering contribution in the field of neurophysiology. Sir, you had been across all parts of the world and we were figuring to connect these dots and how did you manage? 
kindly share your experience as how it was across all these institutions that you had been exposed to in your early career sir then you must have had interesting episodes and do kindly share it with us sir you see at the cook county there was hardly any department of eg and they were doing some at that time i am talking about 1968 69 you know where they are not even they have not even done up they have not even done the 1020 electrode system so i set up their eg lab and then uh, and then you know it became a routine so it, then i said we had, we, had, we had inpatient responsibilities because all of my other thing us uh, sojourn was at cook county but at a different uh, university so we looked after the inpatients and we looked after the outpatients one single thing came out of the i was going to mention in uh, this one what um, abnormal is involved in move, movement disorders what i have done one uh, single uh, is uh, one single uh, What shall we say? Treatment schedule came up. At that time, nobody thought that haloperidol will be the best medicine for chorea and bilirubin. Nobody. I had just read about it, and uh, I had, uh, and I knew that if you use excess haloperidol, you get into Parkinson's. Right. So I said, let's use them. First six patients in Cook County Hospital, I made a, I made a movie order. Uh, co uh, uh, chorea of different kinds, uh, Huntington's and uh, ischemic chorea, uh, rheumatic and uh, bilirubin. Six patients with uh, haloperidol made a movie out of them, which was stop the whole thing. Today, despite whatever you do, the first drug of choice is still haloperidol. The company came and asked me for a movie. I said no. I didn't make the movie to for you to for it. It is for my own this thing. I'm not. Then after that, I came back to India, and uh, that's about. We, we started the practice and we started working. Can I proceed now? Yes, sir. Yes. Okay. Sir. Now in I in the MIN 1972, myself and Dr. G A, whom I worked with most of the time, we worked with the PL 480 program. PL 480 program was uh, sponsored by the NIH. National Institute of Health PL 480 program for epilepsy. First thing we did was we straightened out the uh, electrode. Both of us together straightened out, straightened out the electrode patient. In this thing, you see, at that time we were the first. There was nobody whom we can uh, learn from, whom how to do it. So we, were, we the only thing we did was we straightened out the PL 480 program. Second thing we learned from the whole uh, this thing as we went along in the MIN was. Uh, Treatment of epilepsy. Two papers emerged out of it. One was Ram Murthy and myself, Dr. Ram Murthy and myself, B. R. and myself, on treatment of epilepsy. He did stereotactic uh, placement and lesions in the amygdala, and uh, that that's a, that was a set of papers. And what, the larger paper I came across was 487 patients with uh, epilepsy, out of which 300 370 or odd were. People who had temporal lobe phenomena. So what we did was we took these people and said, "What do the EEG show?" And we found that a significant percentage of patients they didn't show temporal lobe focus. They showed focus somewhere else, central focus or uh, you know occipital focus. Somewhere. So came the concept, which was there already. Now it is gone because you have got much better uh, terms of recording. Uh, the secondary, second, not the primary temporal lobe epilepsy, but the secondary temporal lobe epilepsy, where the discharge travels through the cortex, stimulates the temporal lobe, produces temporal lobe, uh, uh, temporal lobe signs, and then even generalized seizure. But if you go and ablate the temporal lobe in those patients, you will not ablate the patient. You will have to go and test the primary uh, site. And that is where what we call secondary temporal lobe. We have, we have, I had quite a few of them. That is when we published it. We published in the Proceedings of the Institute of Neurology. Somebody commented, on, but I said that's just fine. I mean, you know, it satisfied me that I have done the this thing. The other second thing which we learned as we continued in neurophysiology, neurophysiology again was uh, the first thirty-five uh, patients 
of uh, anterior Hanfeld disease, specifically spinal muscular. We wrote down, published it, and various varieties. I think the various names you hear, you know, I don't think apply anymore longer. They only apply as the anterior muscular disease and spinal muscular atrophy. Since the treatment of skull and spinal muscular atrophy is just now come, and it is beyond the Indian this thing, you can't, you can't do it. I mean, it's too, 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 too expensive. We published it in Journal of Neurological Sciences. Now, this is the only place where uh, institute where we could do. We didn't have electrodes at that time. Now you have flat electrodes. You can place an array of electrodes on the brain, you know, and uh, push in an EEG machine and uh, record them and say, tell the surgeons and tell everybody, yes, look, your seizure is starting here. That is what Dinesh Nayak does. You know Dinesh Nayak? Yes, Hello, sir. do you know Dinesh Nayak? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. That's Very what nice. Dinesh Nayak does. But the, at that time, we had no electrode. And if you had to buy electrode, they had to be made and then sent to us. Grass did it, but it was enormously expensive. So we had one little, pretty little depth electrode. The topmost recording electrode was on the cortex. The deep, deep, deep most recording was the amygdala. And that's how we, do, we did our depth recording. The interesting part of it was we recognized that as soon as we stimulated, we can stimulate this electrode also, you come to respiratory arrest. You're very, very close to the amygdala. They, they, earlier, they told us that's bunk. Now, reports have come that it is true. If you go very close to the amygdala and give a stimulus, you will have a respiratory arrest. And that we took as a, as a sign that we are very close to amygdala and put in whatever we have to do, whatever, either wax or whatever this thing. Now, you want me to ask some more or shall I proceed? Yes, sir, please proceed, sir. I have a okay. few more questions which I'll ask. Yeah, quite a lot to do. You see, at that time, we, we started doing the nerve conduction studies we started doing evoke potentials. We started doing, uh, we spoke in evoke potentials, we started doing somatosensory evoke potentials, brain somatic evoke potentials, um, visual evoke potentials, uh, all our intervals, uh, and sympathetic skin responses. All of them we started doing. And if you think all of this, we learned from outside the country, no. We learned it in the country, here. Uh, in MMA. Look, pardon me. In MIN, sir. In MIN. We read, we, we took out what we read, we attempted to get the same this thing and perfected the technique. I remember very well, we were doing SCPs in Apollo. I mean, the whole squiggly thing came to, 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 to nothing. I couldn't even recognize the P1, the N1, P, N1, N2, N3. Suddenly, a thought came to me look, why don't we magnify? I mean, decrease the resistance. Lo and behold, the whole spectrum was in front of us. And that is how we applied all of it to all, to all the evoke potentials. And if anything, we did one of the things was the, you do the evoke potential very well. Nobody was doing them at that time. Not only in Chennai, I'm talking about. Nobody in the country was doing anything about them at all. So we did that. And um, one minute. We did the pencil nerve conductions or whatever you want to call them. I mean, as a matter of fact, what we did was we created a package for what is called a DM neuropathy, which contained motor, motor conduction studies, sensory conduction studies, autonomic studies, uh, SCPs, uh, RR response, and uh, sympathetic experiment. This was what the patient paid in Apollo for a peripheral nerve study. I mean, it, it, it was, it, it, can, it, uh, income, it took over all the things. And that with that kind of a thing, what we did was interesting thing to, to relate, you see. We took patients with uh, 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 hypoglycemia, unsym asymptomatic, who accidentally went into the master health checkup plan and they were from hypoglycemia. So we caught those patients, got them in, and we applied these parameters to see what does their nervous system do. We presented it at the Indian Academy of Neurology. You'll find if you did that, the motor conduction studies are normal, almost always. You understand? You, but the recipes are abnormal, which means the, the conduction in the nerve uh, is normal, but it is getting delayed up. Yes, sir. You understand? Their BAEP was normal, their VEP was slightly prolonged, their, uh, yeah, and RR interval, yes, very. 
and as he is a sympathetic skin response to aging. So we said that in a diabetic, even before he should become symptomatic, all the neurological things that you want to look at are there electrophysiologically. We proved that, we presented it to, to the meetings. And that was, uh, that was the interesting thing for me. Um, the other thing we did was uh, this one, what in ALS, it's coming true now. ALS, we all thought, spinal muscular atrophy was this thing, but ALS, we all thought it's only a disease process, which is involving the anterior horn cells and the pyramidal tract. Now, what we went and did, the late S.G. Krishnamurti, I don't know whether you know him or not. He, uh, he didn't live, he, I think he expired about two, three years ago. He was my assistant. So I told S.D.K., S.D.K., get all the ALS you can and do a, a CP on them. Let's see. They have no motor neurons. Yes, sir. So they have no reason to show a delay in their CPs. And lo and behold, they all of them, every one of them should be delayed in their uh, N17, N39 potential. Why? That means their tracks are affected from the thalamic uh, structures to upstairs, isn't it? Now, if you recall, the present ALS, a section of it is genetically modulated with the frontobasal dementia. Genetically modulated. So basically all structures can come, all these things can happen. We did that long time ago and said, in the, there is a friend of mine called Andrew Eisen, whom, whom we both graduated from Montreal. Uh, we both became fellows of the Royal College at the same time, same exam, same thing. And uh, he came to me, he said, yes, you're right. Uh, I have done this. He was a specialist in anterior horn cell disease. And he said, you're right. Uh, if you want, we'll hold another symposium only on anterior horn cell disease and show the supra spinal structures are also involved in anterior horn cell disease. We did that long time ago. Now, uh, there was something else we, we Try to do. In, uh, listen, you know, we used to get, we, we got patients with stiffness called stiff man syndrome. Two of them we bought. We went to as far as we could to prove that this is not a peripheral phenomenon. In Jacob's disease, in childhood, there's a whole big hyperactivity of the face. But in, I, we couldn't do that in a child, it's a young child, no? but this two stiff, one stiff man syndrome, I blocked the nerve. I blocked the nerve and found that the blocking of the nerve does not produce, uh, say, the, yeah, blocking of the nerve abolished the hyperactive muscle activity. So that means this uh, is coming proximal to the block because this is blocking. I went up to uh, Earth's point to block the nerve. It was still blocking. So ultimately we decided that um, this, uh, this uh, hyper, uh, hyperactivity in stiff man syndrome is arising from the anterior horn cell because we gave a spinal block and left, and left the, didn't get the spinal, you know, they didn't make him lie on his face. It made him keep him, kept him with his face up. So that means the posterior nerve roots are not. Uh, involved. And with that we reasoned at that time, it's possible that the uh, in uh, anterior horn cell, the uh, anterior horns have become uh, dead, I'm sorry, uh, diseased, and not only diseased, but in stiff mansion. We did that. We published it also in uh, JAMA, and my resident at that time was Niklesh. He got a prize for it. And that is the whole thing. So he got a prize and he's very happy about it. But then what happened? That's how we went. That's how the whole thing goes through. There are so many things we did first time in the, this one. For instance, we conducted four electro physiological workshops, as you know, electrophysiological workshops myself. And if you include my participation in uh, with Dr. G.A. Six workshop, Dr. Eisen, Dr. Aminoff, if you see in the pictures, you know, the fat pump with yes, the, uh, it's, uh, uh, our CM, Aminoff, Gauri, Dr. Feroza Wadia, you know Dr. Wadia who's dead? Yes, sir. And uh, yeah, all of us joined together and we have conducted so many workshops, electrophysiological work. There's one Japanese, I forget the name. There's a book there now, Japanese book. He was with us and uh, we did, uh, it was, what shall we say? It was something you didn't do for money. Yes, sir. 
you did you did it you did it because nobody else has done it and you did because for your own satisfaction you know and the thing that it uh, gave you the uh, the thing of knowing the knowledge of how things work now we did bap because I'm, I'm still in electrophysiology and come back to that because this takes a little time we did the uh, we used the gamma knife uh, to abolish for the seventh nerve, not seventh nerve, yeah, acoustics. We did, the, we two, at least two or three patients we did that successfully. And we took uh, trigeminal neuralgias and used gamma nerves. And again, successfully, we did uh, abolish this thing. The only other thing was uh, what happened was this is, I'm talking about 1960, 1978, about, about that. No, you can't get it. No. Uh, 1978. Uh, I, mean, I still was not born, sir. Yeah, yeah, I'm talking about. That's why I'm saying you should listen to my story. Uh, there was a neurophysiology symposium held in Israel. Israel at that time won't give us a. You can stamp our passport with Israeli, our passport with Israeli visa. I can't have it because next year uh, I was supposed to go for Hajj. To Mecca. And Mecca, if you have the Israeli passport stamped, no hurt. So I told them this thing, uh, Yusuf Kuber or something was in Bombay. He said, okay, look, I'll do this. He said, he issued a separate visa. And I said, look, uh, so we went to Israel, myself and my technician, who, uh, Josh and Paul, we had two papers in them. Tinnitus, what does the VA2 show? It showed a reduction in amplitude of uh, the second. Uh, Second wave in the BAEP, second, uh, second potential in the BAEP, and prolongation. That's one. Uh, that was interesting because nobody had shown uh, eighth nerve lesion in uh, BAEP. We showed that this eighth. Second thing was nerve conduction studies, if you increase the amount of potential, but that was okay. What the best thing about it was, I'm still proud of it. If you ask me what I'm proud of, I'm not proud of all this. I was a Muslim. They allowed me to chair a session in Jerusalem on the Jewish side. And I did it. Maybe we spent a little money, but that doesn't matter. Still, it is a, it's a matter of pride to me that they didn't distinguish that I was a Muslim or not. They did. They only did that you're going to present this material here. You're chairing this session. And Fine. That's okay. Then what happened was, we used VEPs for a lot of things. We used VEPs to confirm Parkinson's. We used VEPs to do, look at pituitary tumors, to look how far the visual this thing has gone, uh, pituitary tumors. Then uh, we, looked, we looked at SCPs in different ways. We looked at SCPs to localize the lesion. For instance, we looked at SCP, SCPs starting from the leg, going on up, 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 or right to an earth point. Till the time they got delayed. And that was the site of lesion. Confirming clinically to you what you say. If you are going to look at a spinal cord lesion, you have to know the anterior, uh, anterior extent of the lesion, the posterior extent of the lesion, the lateral extent of the lesion to know your site and upper and lower extent of the lesion, right? This gave us that. And now what do we do? Now, the only other thing we did in the this one was that we uh, we, had, we got a magnetic stimulator at that time for the Apollo. And yes, uh, you got a magnetic stimulator. Even this was before your time. Today, magnetic stimulation is big. We stimulated the cortex at that time and recorded it from various this thing. To, if there is a cord, for instance, cervical cord, cervical spondylosis, if you record from the thin group of muscles, from the magnetic stimulation, and that stimulus is that you have confirmed your uh, diagnosis of the C5 root lesion. Okay, all right. Uh, we did lots of things on brachial plexuses, in the sense that we did uh, we did uh, CPs of median, radial, and all that. That's all. Because if median is involved, the separate lateral part of the brachial plexus is the same. Middle part of the brachial plexus is involved. Radial is posterior part of the brachial plexus. Uh, and the lateral is uh, ulnar. So we said very approximately, quite, approximately, quite reasonably, you said 
this section of the brake uh, reflex, this section of the um, spinal cord is, uh, this section of the brake reflex uh, is involved. So look at it differently. And clinically, we, we confirm whatever is happening is about true. Okay, we studied the sciatic nerve. We, stu we, we, gave, we stimulated the sciatic nerve right at the uh, uh, right in the hip, and see, for instance, if you had a, this, for instance, if you if you stimulate the sciatic nerve and uh, got a delayed SCP, that means the lesion is not in the sciatic nerve. Either it's got to be cauda equina, or it's got to be pelvic plexus. So what we did was we went to the cauda equina and stimulated the cauda equina. And if the, if the, if the cauda equina is also abnormal, then you have a cauda equina lesion. But if the cauda equina turns out normal, well, you're stupid. Go and examine the patient. He's got a pelvic, plus, pelvic plexus abnormality. I'm giving you a clinic, but what can I do? Yes, sir. I'm learning a lot in this uh, interview, sir. <laughs> okay. Next is strokes. Strokes were not... Uh, I mean, uh, we did... I did stroke. First and foremost, nobody did. Today, you can't even do an angiogram. You can't. Unless you are trained to do percutaneous puncture and then put the catheter in. We had nothing of the sort. Directly puncture the carotid. Okay? Angiograms. There was no RTPA available at that time. Uh, we are the first ones in the country to use um, streptokinase for a stroke. Two patients, we published them. And they got, uh, Dr. G.A. used to keep on repeating it. You talked about chap, he's the one who did the first uh, uh, thrombolysis for stroke. We did that. Uh, there's so many other things we did with this one. For instance, uh, in Apollo, there's a vascular surgeon called Balaji, Dr. Balaji. Pungote, Dr. Pungote's husband. With him, we did carotid uh, awake, carotid endarctitis, and cleared the junk in the carotid. At least two or three patients we did. And afterwards, there's somebody called Sarvanan in our uh, Chennai, I believe, the vascular surgeon. I don't know if that's a waker. I did a waker, a carotid endarctitis. At the time, carotid endarctitis, at the time when no one was thinking about doing it. You understand what I mean? Yes, so sir. that's, we, we got a lot of uh, insight into it. MRA came later, MRI came later. Something else we also did. Septic kinase, I told you. Now, what happened was, we had a patient with uh, rostral basilar artery syndrome. We published it. All things which I'm talking, I have uh, published in small journals, big journals, we have published it. In one patient, the VEPs could not come out to the cortex. In another patient, despite the fact that it was a rostral basilar artery syndrome, the VEPs were normal. So we hypothesized in the, in the journal itself that the lesion where the, where the patient where the BPs didn't, uh, where it could not be recorded, in addition to cortical lesions, had an optic tract lesion. It is only when the optic tract is involved, you don't get a VEP. But if the, uh, if the Cortex, the optical cortex only is involved. You need only half a dozen cortical neurons to show up in the we published it. Uh, St. George's Medical College, Lucknow, gave me an award. I think it's in the, this one. I'll show you the. Have you got it? Can you show it? If it is possible. Now, slide more now. That, is a, that takes time. I have been, I've sent it to you. You see the award. They sent me an award for again talking on strokes. And the next thing was Glaxo Oration. You mentioned the Glaxo Oration. The, yes. the, uh, the title of the Glaxo Oration was, can a ischemic lesion be prevented from becoming an infarct? Today, all the stuff which our colleagues put in, junk, for this, for that, nothing works. The treatment of strokes is only two. One, either you thrombolize him or you go in and pull the, uh, pull the thrombus out. Is there anything else you can do? Nothing. Today, literature is coming that even aspirin is not effective. Particularly in old age group, you are deterred to see your tell you have been the statistics point of don't use aspirin. So that's only the treatment. But we had nothing of it. Nobody put the strengths, not in the carotid, 
nobody puts things um, even cardiac stents they are not putting in why worry about uh, uh, intracranial stents you know and yes. this is the amount we went about now we come to what shall we come to my topic for which i am known my senior i'll keep it short i can keep on talking in my senior what we did was we did a repetitive stimulation before and after cystic um, me and proved that this is the uh, diagnostic thing of uh, my snagrass you want to comment on it I uh, or shall i proceed so you can elaborate further sir we'd be happy to hear no, what we did was we put the patient in the thing uh, did a repetitive stimulation study okay you want a 20% 20% decrement mainly yeah. uh, everybody knows that 20% decrement 20 what i did was i gave intravenous 1 mg transthymine slowly bolus a uh, mix diluted in 10 cc of water i have talked about this all my life uh, so 10 cc of water and then uh, we saw that, that uh, we recorded the this thing which uh, the repetitive stimulation again for it to be this thing your abnormality should have discovered this disappear there is no better this thing uh, test than that in for my synagogues uh, then uh, you, you have a um, single fiber emg i am not very good at single fiber EMG. single fiber emg can be non specific but disappearance with tilstig mean is absolutely right uh, you get my point now yes, it all started with a patient called happy to nessa which is my mother's name the patient came into mian i don't think we were born even then no sir no <laughs> so it happened I, she was my senior graves because i had already seen my senior graves in montreal so we diagnosed my senior graves. but you know we kept on giving tilstigmine tilstigmine the only tilstigmine available gravitor my is not was not available at that time so and she improved but after improvement she became worse And worse and worse and died. So I came back to the same room, took my neurophysiology books, and read why did she die. Hardly did I realize that I was a bloody fool. She died of a bipolar block. That is the new stigmine which was gone. Itself is blocking the end plate. This is what is bipolar, and the treatment is for that is not new stigmine. the treatment is to stop medication people got wiser the next time and that's exactly what they did. when they happened stop medication there are several of them who are doing so we we did and we successfully pulled out uh, pulled out the see, we don't do that right now i mean we have been become very much wiser very very much wiser as far as myasthenia gravis is concerned the second argument was thymectomy before in our time i promulgated thymectomy then i myself because i have seen patients who have uh, who have uh, no myasthenia gravis but have enlarged thymus you take the thymus out and they come back again with uh, myasthenia gravis that is thymus has already seeded the t4 cell into the lymphoid tissue and so they come back with myasthenia gravis so we said why should we take out the myasthenia gravis the thymus if there is no now it has changed they are again coming back time at time even if it is not enlarged mind you so that you can reduce the dose of immunosuppressive drugs and yes. the reduce of dose of steroids that is why time at time needs to be done now whatever immunosuppressive drugs the, yes. the only drug i had at that time immunosuppressive drug was mycofenlic and uh, this was what uh, borovitchimab today you can do toxicimab and so many other maps which are out of our pockets we can't afford them and still you can uh, treat myasthenia gravis with steroids mycofenlic and pulse dose cyclophosphamide fish if you want to use it keeping in mind that it is um, uh, cardiotoxic we all of this was first all of this was first in the country as a matter of fact at that time plasma fluorescence had come out so we used plasma fluorescence both for myasthenia gravis as well as gbs to treat the patient with gbs and uh, the one thing i forgot in strokes was very simple i mean this is what i came to 
If you have an ICH, our, our surgeons go and open the, put a barrel, put a needle, and have you seen any uh, ICH survive? Yes, sir. Have you seen any survive? I yes. have. Not very many. I haven't seen very many survive. The mortality rate for draining the cerebellar, the cerebral hematoma, intracerebral hemorrhage, is much more than what we do. What I did was about three or four patients. Dr. Murugan, Murugan, uh, this one's son. I forget the surgeon, the neurosurgeon in the lab. Murugan is the neurosurgeon. He was yes, neurosurgeon son itself. Uh, but I told him, don't, don't go and put a needle in the brain. Take the whole skull out. Hosta, craniectin. You understand what I mean? Yes, Whole sir. Training. Both for ICH and for malignant uh, and for infarct. As a mm. matter of fact, that author in Germany said, if you suspect that this uh, this infarct is going to swell, take out the cranial. No surgeons will listen to you. I don't know why. Because the patients, after having done cranial craniectomy, survive much better. All the patients that have done craniectomy have survived much better. Then, then these surgeons go and put their needle in and, and uh, take out blood and all that stuff. All you see, once you put the, this thing with the amount of vas, already they have vasospasm. You put a needle in, it increases the vasospasm. And the chances of which patients, of course, there are certain, there are a group of patients who will who you will lose. I'm not saying no. I'm not talking about. It. I'm talking about patients whom you can pull out. You understand what I mean? And you don't need to put a needle to pull it out. You can just take, I want to make this public. I've said everything, I've done it also, that you don't do a needle, take the cranium out, hemicraniectomy, and wait, because the brain swells, it'll swell out, right? And if it swells out, it'll swell back in. It'll go back in. Because the hematoma is not this thing, it is the, it is the whole vasospasm and edema which is causing the brain to swell. We have done that. Okay, and the food. This is for both for malignant uh, middle cerebral artery syndrome as well as uh, you know, intracerebral hemorrhage. Okay, now that was about my skinograms. Now let me see what else do I have. Movement disorders. I told you, Cook County Hospital, I already gave haloperidol. And still today, you show me one drug with the asthma is haloperidol in controlling uh, chorea or hemibilismus. I don't think so. Of course. You run the risk of producing uh, Parkinson's, but you should but you should know what to do. You can't be giving tons of haloperidol. You have to give haloperidol enough to the extent. At that time, in one of the movement disorders, this thing, I I, I hypothesized the ideal thing would be a dopamine, you know, uh, L-dopa and nalorphine combined together, and that is what the this one. Now, what is that called? the new thing uh, for uh, uh, dyskinesias, uh, um, L-dopa induced dyskinesias, they give an injection, extremely expensive injection. See? Now, at that time itself, I said, but it's okay now. The methodology hadn't been developed. So we had developed a model to demonstrate this, but I can't do it now because it was modeled in the sense pictures for me. See? Uh, it decreased dopamine for um, Parkinson's and serotonin, I'm sorry, um, uh, ACH uh, uh, quite a lot and serotonin also quite a lot. You, you increase the dopamine by giving dopa, reduce it by uh, this thing by giving passivity. We did that, but that was still because nobody was talking about it. We had to, we had to educate our uh, people to see, look, this is how you think. You can't give only passivity and sit down. And mind you, at that time, we hadn't, uh, L-Dopa hadn't yet come. It hadn't come. Only after somewhere in 1980, uh, L-Dopa came into the market. Well, then you know what has happened. Now we did, um, uh, we, 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 we talked about the motor, non-motor manifestations of uh, Parkinson's from one of the papers here. We, with Ramurthy, we did deep, deep brain stimulation was not available. There was no deep brain stimulation, yes. either to GP or to subthalamic nucleus. Today, Dr. Agarwal here does a deep brain stimulation. I mean, yes, it's changing. You understand what I mean? 
the ayer and the balakrishnan are doing temporal lobe activities open the skull uh, and uh, take off the medial temporal lobe that time you couldn't do it you couldn't convince the people that you should take off the medial temporal lobe yes that's, that's how it was now the other thing which have now of course you know that in coimbatore they have got a ultrasound linked to the yes mr so that you can destroy the thalamus ultrasound destruction the thalamus both in tremor syndrome as well as in parkinson's okay uh, now infections we come to infections now not very much i i i know i have taken lot of your time i'll finish quickly not a problem sir still i have more questions to ask sir oh yes you want to ask now no so you can complete after infections we can okay, take okay fine in infections we we took uh, we took two sets of infections only for our uh, study one was one was tb meningitis of, of which dr g a is an expert but the thing which i learned was if you have a tb meningitis now and you suspect tb meningitis don't do a lumbar puncture today because if you do a lumbar puncture today the man is going to come and 48 hours more to recover you understand what i mean so what we what we promulgated was you wait for a week you want to treat him with streptomycin blah 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 you treat him you want to teach him other antibiotics are treat him but do the lumbar puncture one a week a week or 10 days later one week is fair enough. now you have enough you have antigens to determine the outer envelope of the tubercle bacillus you have dmnases to look at in the blood you have Uh, specific antigens to look at the main internal capsule, main internal dressing of the bacteria. So you don't have to run to do a then to do a LP and put the patient under put the patient under. I mean, take the risk of losing the patient. You get my point. That is one. In the bargain, what we did was myself, Dr. B R, everybody did. Rajesh Swery, who is the son in Minakshi here. she took all small small things and said it is uh, two o'clock was it is not because promptly after we published the paper in uh, i don't know where uh, cmc will work came back and said these are all not uh, tuberculomas these are cyst cells biopsy proved so we uh, i mean this is uh, i mean we have proven wrong so we accepted it yes for you are quite right but we hadn't done any biopsy Yeah, right. And it can be changed over, but put down the treatment schedule for cystic fibrosis as uh, albendazole. We don't know all those other complicated drugs. It is done. Albendazole you can use for three months. There is no toxicity can be involved with it. Steroids you can use for how long ever you want. And thirdly, age and all your cystic fibrosis is controlled. As a matter of fact, when we are doing this, we came across several patients, young lady girls. First film. We, for uh, just for the sake of humor, we named them Saeed syndrome. I said uh, these people have a cystic fibrosis. Turned out to be cystic fibrosis, but systematically there was too much more cystic fibrosis. So I didn't do anything uh, very brilliant. Yeah, just a cystic fibrosis. It turned out to be cystic. So I, that we uh, we what should we say? Normalize the treatment for cystic fibrosis. There was another drug. I forget the name of the drug because we use so much albendazole. We don't do anything else. Um, that is cystic fibrosis and uh, the tuberculosis now comes uh, the la the more important ones into this thing is uh, you know, we did the uh, depth recording for ssp one patient with it and that raised eyebrows we put a cortical recording we did a cortical recording we did a thalamic recording kalyan raman did it for us thalamic recording same eeg machine and we recorded we put a i mean we directed the electro the, uh, the depth electro so that it touched the thalamus as well as the red nucleus now we looked at the recordings as they came out first recording to come through was emg in the emg uh, this thing what the emg started firing in the uh, muscle channel the red nucleus started firing first red nucleus and thalamus are about the same the cortical firing was much later so we proved the fact that the periodic complexes was coming in ssp were coming 
from deep septum. Nobody has done it. Nobody did it. And nobody has disproved us so far into the, this thing. Then what happened, we presented what WFN and other people on SSP. You know, if you watch uh, standard patients with SSP, they'll, they'll start getting a, a, a fast frequency rhythms. Tuck, 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 and then it'll go on to the periodic complexes. Persistent. If you have a suspected patient with SSP and you have a fast persistent rhythm, uh, you can expect this to break into a periodic complex. So we said, fast periodic rhythm, where will it come first? Persistent. It has to come from support to plexus. It can't come from cortex. It has to come from uh, talus. So we said the discharge starts from the talus. Published. Okay, now next comes the opportunity of hearing this directly from you, sir, during the EEG masterclass as well. You did. Okay, that's good. That's good. Now, what is the other one? I've, I've told you about strokes. I've told you about uh, this one. Um, most of the time, 90% of the time, I work with Dr. G.A. 90% of the time, I work with Dr. G.A. Most of my patients, either is a co-author co or um, He's a co-author with me. Of course, in later part of the years, you will see Shankar, uh, uh, said, but that's my material. I asked Shankar to write it up. And uh, I will be the last author. In any case, if I'm the last author, they'll come back to me. And they know everybody that I'm doing. So Shankar, who else? There's somebody else who wrote up. SGK, Shankar, and then one more person wrote up the, uh, this, uh, wrote up the, uh, material and they came back to us. Now, what else can I say? Now, I I think that's about the, the last time, but not the least. Last, but not the least. I've, I have 23 articles in the newspapers as a political critic. I have the list here. 23. Till the uh, till the, there's a change of regime in the Hindu, and I always published only in the Hindu op, uh, open page. After that, I stopped. When the change of regime came, I stopped. I didn't uh, publish anymore. Newton, and somebody asked him, how is it that you do so much? Said, you see, I stand, I stood on the shoulder of giants. And that's how I was able to see father. And I did so much. I mean, whatever you see, I, I did so much. Now, there were no giants, neurological giants in our time. You understand what I'm trying to say? There are only physicians, Dr. Ratnavalu Subramaniam and Dr. K. V. Both are dead and gone. But they allowed me to do lots of things. They allowed me uh, this thing to, I mean, uh, I still remember Dr. Rathnavalu Subramaniam telling me, somebody's complaining to him, said, oh, he's not yet. <laughs> Don't be stupid, man. He must be examining the motion somewhere in the lab. Go and catch him and bring him. That was how we worked. So we had that. We had, we had the license to do whatever we can, uh, how we do these things. Uh, the same thing happened for the goal of uh, Nagesula upon the gold man. Supramanian cardiologist was the one competing with me. He was from Stanley. He got 25 cases of uh, uh, spinal cord lesion, described the findings. I, there's a needle called Coke needle. I don't know whether you remember it or not. There's a needle with which you do plural biopsies. It is changed names, the plural biopsies. You can do even a liver biopsy. So what I did was I took out uh, uh, about 25 cases of uh, plural effusion. In one, we demonstrated amoeba. We have hepatitis, I mean, I mean, amoebic hepatitis, we took out and demonstrated amoeba in the hepatitis. So this I wrote up for the uh, gold medal. Now, Dr. Ramuti was, uh, was uh, I mean, somebody writes spinal cord, you'll have to support me. You can't say that he'll support me. So that's fine. I mean, he said, he said this. Both Dr. Lake, Dr. Sadasu, and Dr. Ramuti had a bit of an argument, whom to give the prize. Dr. R.S. came in and said, Who's the original? Whose article do you think is original? So both of them agreed, mine is original, and so I got the prize. Nagesh wrote. And that's about all. Uh, I stood on the shoulders of Dr. R.S. and Dr. K. B. Okay. Uh, and to some extent, on the shoulders of Dr. G.A. He allowed me to do a lot of things. And so we did what we have. Now, this is a compact. If I have to go to details, I have to look at all the, they, you, if you will, there's a whole bunch of papers here. 
I haven't looked at them. I just gave the listen. Now you can ask your questions. You're welcome. Sir, Professor Zahir, sir, uh, we all know that you had an excellent library for neurology at times when access to journals were next to impossible. And uh, your extensive post-admission day rounds and the famous Wednesday morning clinical meetings that uh, you had conducted. And we would like to hear your experiences about it, sir. How did you... Uh, uh, you see, uh, the, as far as the OP is concerned, of course, I don't have that kind of OP, uh, not the GHOP. You see, you won't sit in OP. The outpatient has 300 patients. You are not going to distinguish between Wernick Hoffman's disease or uh, spinal muscular atrophy. We have a different variety. You have no time for it, my dear man. What you have to do at that place is, is this man sick enough to be admitted or not? That's the decision you have to take. If he's sick enough to be admitted, admit. If he's not sick enough to be admitted, what is the next first investigation do you want? That's how we ran our OP. No other way. You can't run the OP any other way. If you have to be admitted, the next time the patient came with different, admitted him and then looked at it. But the first time the patient comes, you have no choices. Absolutely no choices in, uh, uh, to do anything else. You see. Of course, I was an honorary professor, but I remember I have gone that night to see the patient both in general hospital ward as well as in mine. And I think, I remember once, I forgot now, at night when Narayan was not there, we did the angiogram uh, to delineate the uh, space of point, which is one side. At night, they, during the day, we are used to it, get the patient down, feel the poor, the puncture the urine. That's how we manage. Because there's no other way. How else do you do? We, uh, and I'm not one of those believers in what Dr. Ramuthi said. We do the pneumograms. Pneumograms are, uh, you can put air in the brain. Uh, how much air can you put in the brain anyway? And if it is a, uh, if it is a, uh, a raised intracranial pressure, uh, it won't work. So that's why we did this. Tell me all other questions I want. Sir, uh, away from neurology, what do you do beyond neurology, sir? What are your favorite I, hobbies? Uh, you see, I like to say, uh, my wife will become very upset if I say neurology is my first love. Can't <laughs> do it. So she is my first love. <laughs> Second, this thing is neurology. Neurology and in, in, in neurology, neurophysiology. In neurology, neurophysiology. Of course, I used to read a lot. Somewhere when I was 60, I think my brain changed. I don't read that much now. It's an aging brain. No? I'm 83. You can't expect the cortical cells to be the same. See? I can't do the same. Uh, so it's an aging brain, but it changed. I write poetry. I used to write poetry. You know, in, in, in English, in uh, Hindi or Urdu, if you wish, I used to write poetry. I can't do it. Something happened. About 65, 66. Something changed. You see, to write poetry, you have to get the rhythm. You understand what I mean? And you have to get the formulation of the words. Let it, it can be English or uh, Urdu, it doesn't make a difference. If you don't get it, I can't do it. No, I can't do it. Yes. That's how I entertain myself, write poetry. I have a book that I've written on about approximately English and uh, Hindi put together about 50 poems. I've kept it. I've That's kept a huge it. number, sir. Do you have any favorite poems of yours that you can share with us, sir? Uh, I don't want to. It's a very personal thing. No? So I okay, said, no, sir. leave it for it. And I told my children, the book goes with me in my grave. Of course, everybody sits on my neck and say, publish it. I said, just like I said, something I don't want to publish. No, that, that this one, the pharma, uh, pharma, pharma, uh, pharmaceutical companies came and said, give us that uh, eight millimeters. Halibut. Uh, we'll give it to you. I said, I'm not doing it. What yes. am I going to do? They'll give me some, uh, what, measly $100, $200. I'm not interested. I said, no, I'm not. They'll give, give it to me personally. That was the thing which started me on treatment of involuntary movements in Chennai. That is Halibut. Today, you do what you want. As far as chorea and hemibelismus is concerned, you have no better drug other than haloprodol. You can use Rivocon. 
I other day I put the patient on Rivocon and he kept vomiting and this thing. I had to pull out Rivocon. I'm not joking. This is true today. So just about two weeks ago. He yes. preferred to stay with his uh, movement disorder. He preferred to take small doses of uh, haloperidol and uh, small doses of loxacin. That's all. Couldn't take uh, Rivocon. Rivocon is tetrabenazine. Yes. Now, a new product has come, valibenzine. So I don't think it's available. So we can't use it. Yes, sir. And uh, Professor Zahir, sir, you were born in an illustrious family whose members have contributed to the field. Oh, of medicine. I didn't say that. You didn't show my wife's picture. Shall I show them? Shall I show yes. the picture? Yes, sir. We have. Uh, I have all the images that you have. Uh, yeah, I have already sent it to you. My wife is the most illustrious one. Sir, we have the images here, sir. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have the images. I want to, I, I'm going to get it. Soon. This, this is me talking on uh, brain death. The previous one. He's playing. I can't. He's not playing. Are you? Are you putting up the images? Yes, sir. I'm putting up the images, sir. Okay. There is my myself and my wife are there. So this image. No, this is this is Mr. This is uh, uh, an IAN meeting in Chennai, where Michael Aminoff is the white man. He did yes, the whole. Uh, he did the workshop with me. The electrophysiologist. I was the president of the IAN at that time. Yes, sir. And uh, that was the time I, I told uh, Doctor. I mean, our CM. Sir, you did a wrong thing by abolishing the honorary, uh, honorary professor seats. The nine of one of the Western surgeon, Chandra Pokhan, the nine of one. I said, you honorary professors, you you will get honorary professors, the most trained ones, most literate ones, uh, highly qualified ones for for nothing, hundred and fifty rupees a month. Can you imagine? That's what I worked for. I didn't even take the money. In, uh, same thing GA did. We didn't take the money. We worked there and we had our own small, our large practices and we, we got our own. This is the, you can, you can again go up, whatever you want. Now, this is BRM. I don't know the last person, um, go ahead, and yeah. Velu. It's one of the workshops, yeah. physiology workshops. Uh, this is again, uh, I think it is the IAN meeting. You can see Natrajan there. Uh, you can see, no, no, here's the workshop, yes. Uh, this is a lady, Indian lady, uh, who specialized in EEG, came over, and uh, we were conducting the workshop. You can go yeah. ahead. It's the same group, which is essentially no different from there. You can see the last one on the right is from Joyce and Paul, my chief technician. SDK is here, who's no more with us. GA is standing behind. And Michael Amanoff is wearing a showing off his garb. Yes, sir. Same thing. This is Ram giving us the uh, Lifetime Achievement Award. Uh, the person who got it with me is uh, Ram is Hindu. Yes. Ram is Hindu. You know, the paper, newspaper. Hello. Yes, newspaper. sir. Um, he was the chief guest. He's doing the uh, uh, lifetime achievement award. There's one more people. One more picture will come. To. Yes, sir. This is the GA. I, I think one of the this ones, whatever it is, they gave me some whatever. And I don't remember the one. And this one, sir. This one is. Um, this is a neurologist from US. I forget his name. He was from Jackson, Mississippi. I forget his name. This is Shankar from. Uh, Nimhans. He's yes. the pathologist. He's the one who started the tumor registry, who started the uh, Jakob Kurtzfeld registry. But persons who, who showed the Jakob Kurtzfeld is us. I'm saying us. I'm not saying me. Patient was admitted under us. Okay. How did we diagnose Jakob Kurtzfeld? Uh, he, was, he was having jerks. So we went to the ECG. And you see the complexes coming through. I was the first one who said, this is Jakob Kurtzfeld. Well, I knew it was Jakob Kurtzfeld, 100%. But I was reassured when uh, our pathologist, you know, Satsabhati, came and insisted, I want a, we want a biopsy, we want a biopsy. We, want, we did a biopsy. 
and we gave we have sent Guzrar Yakub Kotsal to the Hindabas. But before we could, I could write it up. She went and wrote it up. This fine doesn't make a great deal of it. One of us wrote from the institute and said, "Still Yakub." She didn't even thank us for the thing. But that doesn't make small. It makes small. That small change. I don't believe. But he is the one who started the registry for the Jakob Jakob Kreutzfeld. Pituitary tumors. He started the registry, and uh, this one, what uh, Alzheimer's. He started the. He is retired now. He is a polio affected man. He couldn't walk. Shankar. Yes, sir. Go ahead. Well, this is the same meeting. You really, you know who he is? No, we don't know. Kunhunda no, uh, sir. Kunhunda, sir? Minister Power, our chairman. Yes, Kun, he owns Kunhunda in the city. Okay, sir. Okay. Uh, he is. Uh, he was what? Uh, uh, I forget uh, this thing. What portfolio he held? He came yes, to the this one IAN meetings uh, yes, when sir. we invited the uh, when CM came, and that that's him writing the Yes, sir. And now uh, ah, there you are. That is uh, Jacob Chandu, Arjun, yes. Bhagwan Sahani, myself, Jacob Chandu. We got the Lifetime Achievement Award at the same time, Jacob Chandu. Uh, Bhagwan Sahani came for almost every one of our meetings, some meetings in town, which were held up, which was taken, which place was filled by Firoza, Firoza Wadia. You know Dr. Wadia, late Dr. Wadia, and yes, uh, he, his wife. That, at that time, Firoza Wadia was alive. So we yes. called Firoza Wadia. And Firoza Wadia was something good about it. She could do. We, I would struggle to get a single fiber. But she put the needle, took, 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 there's a single fiber. We could do very well. So that's why we came and asked her to come and do the single fiber. Something which I uh, specialize in is what's called DSCP, dermatomal CPs. That is, you don't stimulate the nerve. You keep your electrode in the in that dermatome and then stimulate the brain, get an SCP. You see, it's a very good one. For instance, you can locate L5, S1, L4 lesions just by the dermatome. Lesion. Of course, Andrew Eisen did it first. But in the country, I did it first. And said, okay, this is an L5, S1 lesion. You no, know, no, it, it was very simple and easy. You see, you go from T1, DSCP, 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 no DSCP level of parapet. You understand what I'm trying to tell you? Yes, sir. DSCP, 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 all normal. You come here, become abnormal, it is obvious. Parapet. Yes, sir. Same thing we did for Alta, for uh, this one, a median now. You understand what I mean? So we kept the stimulating electrode here. We recorded from the median now. Okay. When we I mean, distal to the carpal tunnel. We stimulated there, deformed or no median nerve, and the deformed or very, very poor SCPs came down, came down, came down, no SCPs. We crossed the carpal tunnel and stimulated the median normal SCPs. Best uh, proof for you are saying that it is a carpal tunnel. Same thing we did for uh, ulnar nerve too. That's called funny name it has got. We, uh, I think we, we didn't report them. Two patients with ulnar nerve, these things, we did the same thing. And proved it. I mean, this is in addition to doing the nerve conduction studies. But we said it is much simpler to do the SCPs and prove it. So, next. That's a, that's a workshop in progress. Workshop in progress. No, sorry. This is at the University of Jordan, which I visited when we went to when we went to Jerusalem for presenting our material. There, we, we have to, for going to Jerusalem, we have to get down at Jordan. And you have to, from Jordan, you have to take a bus. And the bus will cross into Jerusalem under extreme police care. And the police there is uh, uh, all women with, with their uh, short buttons half open. Difficult procedure, difficult times. Uh, particularly with the half open, this thing in policemen carrying stand. You can't do, you can't move your finger. You move your finger, you, have, you run the risk of getting shot right there. So we were told, don't do anything, no bravados, nothing. Sit in the bus, go there, and then same. University of Jordan. Now what is this? This is, uh, I think, the Delhi workshop. 
uh, where uh, Joy Sunpal, my chief technician, and uh, this is Pradeep, who is at Palghat. The rest of them are postgraduates at that time. We did the, uh, I think it's one of the neurological society or no, it is not uh, this one, but it is not uh, an academy meetings. It is a neurological, this one, what uh, the NSI meetings. I forgot to tell you, I must tell you that, that is interesting. There's a meeting at Manipal, myself, and there's a person called Jagjit Singh Chopra, he's dead, he didn't want. You have heard of him? No, sir. You haven't heard of him. Jagjit Singh Chopra was the chief of neurology at Chandigarh. For quite some time, myself, him and myself were fighting with uh, NSI to give us what belonged to us so that we can start a special society. So in the Manipal meeting long, long time ago, it started in 1980 or 1976, 77, that kind of a date. I don't think you were born at that time. So, we sort of this thing, particularly this thing, Jagjit, Jagjit came and said, hey, shall we start? And they said, sure, right now. So myself, Jagjit Singh Chopra, Krishnamurti Singh was no more with us. Three of us started the Indian Academy of Mumbai. One week later, I, I, I named the journal Annals of Indian Academy of Mumbai. After that, everybody came. They became founding member, non-founding member, all that is fine. But we are the three who started the journal. The next person who joined us at that same meeting a little later was uh, Viru. But we are the three who started the Indian Academy of Neurology at the Manipal. This, we, I think, uh, is a Neurological Society meeting, uh, which you can see when my, uh, the, uh, this person is uh, Joyce and Paul. This is team. Here is Pradeep, who is now a very senior ultrasonologist in uh, Palghat and stroke uh, neurology. Yes, sir. Go ahead. This is uh, Chandra, this one, who Raj Sekharan, Professor of Neurology at Trandon Medical College. Yes, and, sir. Uh, the AVS on the left, uh, yes, on my left, your right. And uh, well, we'll stop at that because Raj Sekharan was not ever in, uh, nowhere near the founding uh, this thing. But he was very scared that he would not be a chairman, he would not be a, what shall we say, president of the society. Anyway, he became, he, he took the decision. And then uh, later on, the next step was IBT. This is again Jordan. This one you can see. This is again where we are awarded the, uh, this one, what um, Lifetime uh, Achievement Award. I am there, Ram there, and Dr. KJ. KJ is no more with us. Okay. This is all small, old things. I don't even remember which ones there are. KJ is there, I am there. You can see my hair had become, uh, started to become white quite early. Really yes. quite, you know. And these were uh, neurophysiology workshops and these things. AVS is there. Yes, sir. This is, okay. This is uh, Sudha Ramachandran. Uh, Dr. SKR's assistant, surgeon. Yes, sir. A husband, dental surgeon. Me, yes, sir. neurologist, Ravi Ramuti, Ramuti's son, uh, Veena Trajan, our Veena Trajan. Yes, sir. And yes, sir. Dr. Reginald, neurosurgeon. Interesting combination here. Yes, sir. Okay. Wow, this is old, 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 old. This is uh, Dr. Rao, Hyderabad, neurosurgeon. Myself. I don't know this one. This is Dr. Reddy. Dr. G is a very good friend, who's a neurologist. I think he's also known. Yes, sir. I don't know whether uh, Dr. Rao is there. Ah, there. Now we are coming to... No, my wife's thing came. No, there. That is my wife. She is... Yes, sir. Can we take all of this? Sir? Illa. Face very like. Can you see the face? Yes, sir. I can see it. I can't see the face here. Downloading 91 management. Okay. She is uh, she's seven years younger than me. She's a lawyer. 
She's an activist for women's rights. She runs an NGO. Uh, she's a member of the board, SIT in Yella, SIT Women's College, member of the board there. And what else, you know? Anything else? And that's about it. Yes, sir. And First, we also had the opportunity to see ma'am at the background earlier. Sir. See? Pardon me. Uh, so we had the opportunity to see she madam. Went to she went to a third COVID. She, couldn't, she, she said she couldn't read this. She went to a third COVID just now and getting out of the quarantine period. So she came back. Yes. Uh, so that is, I have, I don't have my children. They generally don't. My, my daughter is here. She's a lawyer. She doesn't. Oh, this is great picture. Prabhaka, Chandigarh, JK, JK Murthy, Hyderabad. Uh, that lady, I forget her name, Lucknow, myself, Naushir Wadia. Yes, sir. Not alive. Venkat Raman, retired, come here. Nadaraj, uh, Bangalore, retired. Gauri Devi, retired. She did the, this thing before. Yes, sir. And we can see all the eminent neurologists in this photo, sir. Well, all of them are here. GA is behind. Yes, sir. GA is behind. Yes, sir. Yeah, basically. This is a very valuable picture, really. Yes, now, sir. That is my... Go ahead, please. This is my degree. Neurology, FRCP in Canada, in Latin. It's excellent, sir. In Latin. And that is my Glax oration from uh, Academy of Medical Sciences. Yes, sir. That is the neurological, uh, Montreal Neurological picture. Yes, sir. That is in English. The same certificate from uh, fellow. This is the this thing I'm Black awarded to me from Lucknow for the yes, lecture sir. I talked on strokes. Yes, sir. And this is the last photo that I had, sir. This is silver. It's oxidized. Yes, sir. This whole this thing is silver. Silver made out of yes, sir. But it but looks... me, it's oxidized, so I can't change it. If I take it out, it might break off. That's the only thing. Yes. This is, the last, this is the last photo I had, sir. And uh, one question, sir. That is, uh, Professor Zahir Star has been the mentor to generations of neurologists who are now heading the departments of neurology at various institutions. No, I have gone one step uh, older. Now, my <laughs> students, students are heading the department. Yes, sir. My student, my student was Kamakshi. Yes, sir. My student was Natrajan. My student was Avius. Now their students are heading the departments. Yes, sir. Tell me. And uh, his illustrious career spanning 50 years in the field of neurology continues as he treats patients and carries on his brilliant academic work. At times when digitalization is fast transforming healthcare, the vast changes that the current decade has witnessed the relevance of clinical neurology remains unmoved and is irreplaceable. And sir, what is your advice and the message to the young neurologists and postgraduates for their future careers? All the sex which I have said, SCP, uh, BA, all that can be learned. I mean, now it's all in books. It's all in journals. You have to sit down, read, get your standard measurements. In. But the only one thing which can't, I'm going to, I'm going to illustrate it by a uh, I'm going to illustrate it by uh, what happened to me. We were in uh, Dr. G's, uh, G's office. I'm sorry, G's. Uh, we were doing rounds in uh, MIN, fourth floor. That was a pediatric ward left. Used yes. to be pediatric. So we got a message from uh, Dr. B.R., whose surg surgical this thing was down. Uh, so, will you examine this patient? The person who brought the message was Dr. Narayan, who's no surgeon. So he brought the message to Dr. G. G. I said, uh, so he please see the patient. So we examined the patient. We didn't wait three days. We examined the patient the same evening or the next morning, along with my PG, along with our PGs. And we said, there's a message in what I'm saying. We said, this patient has a conus intramedullary tumor. The patient went for surgery next morning. 
Narayanan, Dr. Narayan, who came and uh, who came back and said, uh, Zahir, how did you make a diagnosis of conus intermedullary tumor? Now, how can I explain that? I can't explain it. So only thing I left to told Narayan is, Narayan, if you want that kind of a clinical examination, you'll have to come and work with us. You can't do anything else. I, so I explained to him generally, you see, if, if he's a paraplegic, if he's a leaking paraplegic, it's an intermediate tumor. If he's a, if he's a, a spastic bladder and paraplegic, it's not an intermediate tumor. But that's not how we made a diagnosis. We made, we made step by step by step by step and said, that kind of thing you have to come into it. You can't, uh, you can't um, say that uh, you'll sit in your throne and learn how to examine. So that is the thing which I must pass on to the younger generation. You may have to examine your patient not once. You may have to examine your patient four times. I have a patient, I have a patient now who's been called to be a cerebral or ataxia. It could well be. He says the sensory system is normal. He says his motor system is normal. It's only cerebral or ataxia. And that has come in quite an old age. Quite an old age. There are not too many cerebral or ataxias, familial or otherwise, coming in old age. You understand what I mean? Yes, sir. There are not many. Very few. Very, very few. I haven't, um, I have not had an opportunity to examine the patient. If I examine the patient, I don't know what I'll find. So I left it open. When there's an opportunity, you let me know. I examine the patient and tell you. But you wanted me to tell me what I, what I have to tell the students. Whatever this last intramedullary, conus intramedullary tumor conveys, you have to examine the patient. There is a history and there is an examination. By the time the patient walks, you must have the history. By the history, by the patient walks in and by the history, you must have a diagnosis. If you don't have a diagnosis by the time you have taken a history and you have uh, uh, looked at the patient when he's walking, well, good luck to you. Maybe neurology is not one of your choices, should not be one of your choices. That's the speciality how it is. It does not permit, it's a very competitive speciality. It does not permit any other this thing to grow. It does not. What can I do? We are renting our, uh, this thing. I do not know whether the next range of neurologists are going to be that paranoid about examining a patient. Whatever you can do, you can do any examination you want. You can do any uh, MRI you want. You can do anything, but you have to examine your patient. You have to listen to his history. Listen to the history. The patient is giving you the diagnosis. We don't listen to him. So that's all I have to tell the research. All other are uh, ancillary procedures. You understand what I mean? Yes. They, are they can be learned. They can be unlearned, you know. Now artificial intelligence is coming. You can unlearn it. The, uh, the computer will uh, do all the tests and tell you here it is the test. Yes, no problem for it. But this, the computer is not going to examine the patient. You know, examine the patient like a neurologist would examine and then uh, do what it is. Then take the next procedure. Now, I mean, so many times, uh, uh, right now, I have patients who come in. Sir, MRI is done. Sir, there is a MRI scan. I don't need the MRI scan. Lots of times. You know, the, when you need it, I'll tell you. Absolutely, I don't need it. So scan, you know, don't like it. Bad luck, what can I do? I don't need it. Now I have to bend down to say, if you want the scan for your comfort, you take the scan, but not for my uh, examination and for, for, not for my uh, this thing. I remember there was a patient who came to me right in this chair where my secretary is sitting. She had a tumor, it was a funny, uh, funny tumor of her name. They had operated it, removed it. Uh, scans have been done every three months, four months. And it said, don't you like a scan? No, I don't like a scan. What am I going to do with the scan? She's having fits. I have to control the fits. And that is what is more important. Scan, yes, I can look at it. 
if you if you don't know how to look at a scan the radiologist would look at a scan and tell you what the this thing is he will even tell you how bad a glioma it is no problems but examining the patient is what is important examining the patient and coming to a conclusion what is next to be done I told her next nothing to be done. Take your you should be operated. Not that should not be operated. Take your antibody anti epileptic drugs. Uh, this thing. Get a scan every every six months and then come back to me. If the tumor enlarges, then we'll see what we can do. Sir, we thank you very much for your valuable time on behalf of the Indian Academy of Neurology and the words of wisdom and the guidance to the young neurologists like me and students. And it would take us a long way in our career, sir. Thank you very much, sir. I thank you also for giving me this opportunity and uh, I wish you all the best. And if you have any problems, don't hesitate to write to me, speak to me, or do whatever you want. I'm you, always sir. waiting. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. God bless. Thank you, sir.